All right. Hi, guys. How's everyone doing? Good. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, I actually just realized my big head is behind me. Creepy. But anyways, uh, I'm glad to hear everyone's doing well. Uh, my name is Jordan Burnham, and as you just heard, I am a, a professional public speaker on mental health and suicide prevention. Now, I'm here today on behalf of a speaker's borough that belongs to Active Minds. How many in here have heard of Active Minds? Okay, three. So, that's what I'm here for to explain what Active Minds is and what I do. Now, Active Minds was an organization that was founded by Allison Malman in 2001. As a junior in college, she actually lost her brother to suicide. Now, she realized that no college students, organizations, were speaking on this subject, on suicide, on mental health issues, mental health disorders. So she decided to have this organization and start this organization where college kids, where high school kids, middle school, anyone could discuss these issues. Now today, there's actually over 300, nearly 400 college campuses that have Active Minds as a branch. So it's my job to go around the country to speak to young adults, to adults of all ages. And I know as soon as I get up here and start speaking, you're thinking, why is this GQ wannabe kid lecturing us and why mental health? But I never want this to be a lecture, more of a conversation between me and you guys, my audience, on a really important subject, which is mental health. Now, right off the bat, I'd love to know from the audience, what are some of the words that you think of when you hear mental health? Any words that come to your mind? You can just shout them out if you want. Depression. Depression. Very serious. Very serious. Crazy. Stress. Crazy, someone said. All right, um, here's an easier question, kind of a fun question. I think I know the first answer. Who are some of the celebrities we think of when we hear the words mental health? Charlie Sheen, all right. <laughs> we can stop there, that's all we need to know. <laughs> Actually, I spoke, at this, um, I spoke at this high school outside of Philly uh, one and a half years ago, and I asked that same question, and usually people just shout out answers. But this one time, this girl, she was really short, so she stood on her chair and she raised her hand. And so I called on her, and these were her exact words. Based on a wardrobe at the VMAs, I believe Lady Gaga should be under the title of mental health. <laughs> now I understood what she was saying, Lady Gaga has some, you know, interesting outfits, However, I kind of like Lady Gaga, you know, rah, rah. All right, anyways, so uh, we think of words like crazy. We might think of words, you know, we think of depression. We think of mental health. Uh, we might think of a celebrity shaving their head and dating Kevin Federline. Um, <laughs> or we think of mental health, but we wouldn't think of someone who looks like me who suffer, suffers from depression and try to take his own life. But today, I don't want to just focus on just me, just my story, but on mental health issues and mental health disorders. Mental health issues is something we all go through. It's how you view yourself internally. That could be affected like going through a breakup, your parents getting a divorce, going through a divorce, feeling as though you don't fit in. Those are your mental health issues. Then there are mental health disorders, which you're diagnosed with, like depression, bipolar, schizophrenia. Now, one out of four college students suffer from a mental health disorder in a given year. But up to two-thirds of those students won't seek help. Why is that? Embarrassed, stigma, denial. denial. So if two out of, actually, if one out of four college students break their arm, I'm pretty sure they're all going to get help, go to a doctor, get a cast, whatever they need to do. But when it comes to mental health, people don't like to do that. There's a shame and stigma associated with it, but I'm hoping by the end of this conversation, it makes it easier for you guys to have this conversation and talk about it. So I want to start my story off with where I'm originally from, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So as far as my mental health issues go, I'm still getting over the Super Bowl, to be honest. <laughs> now, growing up in Pittsburgh, I had my mom and dad, who both work in school districts, and my sister, who is five years older than me. Now, growing up, my sister and I got to attend private school, which was great because the kids there accepted me for who I was as a person. It was like being in one big family, comfortable in my environment. But in third grade, my dad gets a new job meaning now I have to go to public school. Now I'm thinking that the transition from private to public school is going to be an easy one. I get there, and it couldn't be any more different. I'm made fun of for the way that I talk, the way that I dress. I was told that I talk too proper, that I dress too preppy. Kids would come up to me, and because of those two things, they would say, Jordan, you act white. Now after hearing that for about a week, I had a good comeback. So someone said it to me a week later. They said, Jordan, you act white. I said, Oh yeah? Well, you act stupid. What? <laughs> and I got punched in the head that day. 
Um, so needless to say, my transition wasn't going too smoothly. When I got home at the end of the day, my sister was going through the same type of problems, the same type of issues. So in a way, my sister became my therapist because she could relate to everything I was going through and vice versa. That's how we became so close. We became best friends going through elementary school and middle school. Now, there were three different things that helped me get by whenever I was going through a rough time. My healthy coping mechanisms. Now, the first was sports. I love sports. Basketball, baseball, but to this day, my favorite sport and my best sport is golf. I remember growing up, I wanted to be just like Tiger Woods on the course. <laughs> you can deal with the other stuff. Um, I also, I love to tell jokes. I love being the class clown. It made me feel more comfortable if people were laughing at me. The third thing was growing up. The girls thought it was aight. So talking to girls, dating girls, it was a good self-confidence booster. So going through third grade, going through the rest of elementary school and the middle school, those three things actually were able to gain me some popularity. I was actually able to gain friends that I knew I could trust and talk to. But in seventh grade, two major things happen. One is that my sister goes off to college. Now I was happy for her, I was proud of her. She got a scholarship to go to Penn State University. Now even though I'm happy for her, that's my best friend leaving. Who am I going to talk to now whenever I'm having a bad day? Who's going to be that one person I can vent to about anything? I don't have my best friend anymore. Second major thing that happens is my dad goes to interview for this job. It's some weird town called King of Prussia. Only thing I ever heard about it is it has a kind of big mall. Didn't know it was the second biggest mall in the country, but I thought that was kind of cool. Now, my, da my dad goes for that interview, and he accepts the job out there. So I'm faced with a difficult decision in seventh grade. Do I stay with my mom in Pittsburgh until she gets a job out in the Philadelphia area, or do I move with my dad right away? I knew how difficult that transition was the first time, going to a new school, so I figured I'll get it out of the way as quick as possible. So I moved to this weird town of King of Prussia, get to this new school, and I asked my dad before, Dad, what job are you going to interview for? And when he told me he got the job, he said, Upper Marion. I got so excited. I said, Dad, I'm definitely coming out there. This is a major step up. I'm so proud of you. Give me a hug. Kobe Bryant went there. That's amazing. He said, no, Jordan. Um, Kobe actually went to Lower Marion, but are you still proud of me? I said, Dad, not as much, <laughs> but still supported him on taking this new job. And so I get there, and I made fun of for the same things, the way that I talk, the way that I dress, the person that I am. The only difference this time is that my sister's not there at the end of the day to talk about what I'm going through. I don't have that best friend anymore. Now, my dad was there, but he's getting adjusted to a new school. I don't want to bother him. I feel guilty for leaving my mom back in Pittsburgh, so I don't want to bother her. My sister's at college. I don't want to bother her. So it was the first time I kept these negative, depressed emotions internal. I kept them to myself. Now, there was a therapist at my middle school. She had her own office. You could talk to her whenever you wanted. But I, I thought you only went to see a therapist in an extreme situation, like if my parents got a divorce or someone close to me passing away. I didn't know I could walk into her office and just say, hey, I'm having a bad day. Can we please just talk about it? So I shied away from her office. Going through seventh and eighth grade, I used those three things all over again. I played sports. I told jokes. I talked to girls, which made me popular again. Going into the ninth grade, I was voted class president, which is something I should have been really happy and proud of. But at the same time, I feel like I'm in a community, but I'm not really a part of one. I went to school with fake laughs, with fake smiles. So maybe the people around me that called, them fr called themselves friends, maybe they were fake too, because they didn't know the true me, the true Jordan. Now ninth grade, high school, that was a rough transition for me. It was the first time I started doing a lot of different things. Ninth grade was the first time I started trying to please other people instead of myself. I dressed a certain way, hung out with certain people, went to parties, dated certain girls just to fit in, just to become popular. Ninth grade was also the first time I started drinking. And I didn't drink just to get drunk, black out, get wasted. I drank because that was the one time me and my guy friends could talk about something real other than girls or sports. I'll give you the perfect example. Uh, one of my good friends in high school, his name was Tom, and he's this huge defensive lineman football player, huge guy, he's like six foot something. Now, we were at a party one time, and Tom drank way too much. So I went upstairs to go check on him and make sure everything was okay. So I get upstairs, and he's in a room by himself, and I hear the music is really loud, and it sounds like he's singing. But I've never heard Tom sing before, so this is kind of weird. So I get close to the door, and I crack open the door, 
And through that crack, I see Tom singing and dancing to a Hannah Montana song. <laughs> so I open up the door, and Tom's just as nervous and surprised as I am. Like, hey, man, how you doing? Um, why do you know this song, and why are you singing it? To this day, I've never gotten a more serious stare. Look, Hannah Montana is a great singer, and I love her. Cool? I was like, I guess it has to be. <laughs> um, so that's just one example of Tom would never admit that he loves Hannah Montana, sings and dances to Hannah Montana when he was sober, but when he was drunk, it was okay for him to admit that. And he could just blame it on drinking too much. That was the first negative coping mechanism that I picked up in high school, was that it wasn't awkward for a guy to talk about how he fet, felt when we were drunk, when we were drinking. So that was the one thing I used to express my emotions and my thoughts. Ninth grade was also the first time that I started to see my grade slip. I couldn't figure out why. Couldn't figure out why I just couldn't pay attention in class. I could never hand my, I could never hand my homework in on time, and it felt like I was 10 steps behind everyone in my class. I couldn't put the pieces together and figure out why. Now, 10th grade was the first incident that my parents and I had that led me to go see a therapist. It was supposed to be a happy day. I was going to take my driver's test. Now, I was excited because I was under the impression that once you get your driver's license and get a car, you get a lot of girls. Now, you don't, but I didn't know that at the time, so I was very excited. <laughs> and so I get there, I'm a little nervous, a little anxious, I uh, do the blinkers, I get to the stop sign, stop, go to Parallel Park, hit the curb five times and fail, and this is something that I'm really pissed off about. Something that a lot of people can shrug off, joke about that day, but to me, it made me really angry but I kept it inside, I didn't talk about it. Second time comes around. I get there, still nervous, still anxious, do the blinkers, get to the stop sign, stop, go to Parallel Park, hit the curb another five times and fail again. Now this time, I'm really pissed off. I wanna yell, I wanna curse someone out, I wanna punch something, but again, I hold on to it internal. I just keep it on the inside. Now, the third time comes around, all I've been doing is practicing parallel par parking. I know I've got it down pat. So I get there, I'm not even nervous anymore. I get there, I do the blinkers, and I get to the stop sign, and I didn't wait for the momentum of the car to completely stop, which I thought was baloney, because I stopped at the stop sign the way my dad does. I'll show you what he does, all right? So my dad's driving, talking, whatever he's doing. He gets to a stop sign, and he never completely stops. He just slows down, and he's like past the stop sign. He looks left, right, got a text, no, and then goes off. But that's bad, don't do that by the way. Um, but obviously that wasn't the right way to stop and the driver instructor failed me for the third time. Now at this point my emotions worked like a rubber band. I could go back and extend for a really long period of time, but when I let go of those emotions, I snapped. And that's what I did that day. I yelled at the driver instructor and I cursed him out because I thought he looked like a fake Bernie Mac that made me so mad for some reason. <laughs> I yell when I curse at my dad and my dad has no idea where this is coming from. Where's the Jordan that's always happy, that's always smiling? Where's this Jordan coming from that's now yelling and cursing at me in public? So he took it as disrespect and he left. I had to walk 10 miles just to get home. Now during this time, I'm so angry, I'm furious. I don't even realize how far I just walked. But right before I get home, my mom calls. And she says, Jordan, just calm down. Your dad told me what happened. Meet me at McDonald's and we'll talk about it. Now, I didn't want to go. I'm upset with my dad. I don't want to talk to my mom. But it was Shamrock Shake season. So I figured that and a Big Mac will solve everything. So <laughs> I get there and I start talking to my mom. And my mom doesn't just bring up the driver's test, but how I've been feeling overall emotionally and mentally, about being at this new school, about my sister being away at college, my anger management. And finally, she gets to it. She says, I think we should go see a therapist. Now, in my mind, I'm a 16-year-old guy in high school. Anything I'm going through, I can drink it off, play sports and forget about it, talk to my girlfriend about it. There's no reason for me to see a therapist. But my mom did a really good job of talking me into going, meaning she forced me to go. <laughs> and so, you know, I get to my therapist's office, and I'm very judgmental. I'm looking the lady up and down, and it's this older white lady. And I have nothing against older white ladies, but I'm thinking to myself, how could she ever understand what it's like for a 16-year-old black male going through high school? She can never relate to me, especially not like my sister could. I learned that it's a process. It's a process finding the right therapist and actually gaining that trust, that foundation and comfort in talking to them. Because it's just like any other relationship. It takes time before you can tell a new friend, before you can tell someone in a new relationship how you feel. 
And that's what it was like for me going to see a therapist. Now, the mistake that a lot of young adults make is that they go to see a therapist for the first time. The first therapist they see isn't the right one for them, and they say, well, I tried it, they don't go back. I always equate it to a bad first date. I've had plenty of bad first dates. None of them were my fault, but I've had bad first dates. <laughs> and it didn't stop me from dating completely. I just stopped calling her. So, <laughs> I'm just joking, I wouldn't do that, ladies. All right, so, <laughs> so for me it was a process of finding the right therapist, and I finally did. It still took time, though. Now, 10th grade was the year that I was diagnosed with depression. And I didn't know what that meant because depressed, depressing, depression, the words that are overused in our society that we don't know what the true meaning is. And there is a difference between being depressed and actually having depression. Anyone in here can be depressed, but when you're depressed, you know what you're depressed about. Maybe someone just passed away. You're going through a tough time in school. It's the anniversary of something very saddening to you. But you know why you're crying. You know why you don't want to get out of bed, why you just don't feel like yourself. But with someone like me, who has depression, they can wake up one day and have no idea why they're crying. While they have such a low self-esteem, have no idea how to get motivation to get out of bed. Now, it's very frustrating. And it wasn't whether I was going to wake up having depression or not. It's just what level am I on today emotionally because of my depression. One or two is saying, I'm so low that I'm thinking about taking my own life. Nine or ten is saying, today's a good day, but what's tomorrow going to be like? A very pessimistic way of viewing the world. Now, I didn't tell anyone that I was diagnosed with depression. I figured if word gets out that Jordan has depression, I'll be considered weird and weak for going to talk to a therapist, for taking medicine. So I just kept it to myself. I only told my girlfriend at the time and my parents, my sister. I figured those were the only people that needed to know. Now, going into my junior year, how many of you have heard, have told someone, whatever it is, that junior year in high school is the most important year when it comes to grades, sports? How many of you have heard that? All right, everyone. <laughs> so there's this kind of um, pressure going into your junior year of high school, and I hated that pressure for two main reasons. The first was that my sister was a valedictorian in high school. She got a scholarship to go to Penn State University. I thought I had to live up to everything that she did. And no one ever told me that. My parents never told me that. She never told me that. But I put that unfair pressure on myself and would beat myself up if I just got a B or a C on a test on my report card. I beat myself up for that. The second reason I hated that pressure was because I wasn't a school person. I could never wake up on time. I could never pay attention in class. I was always sleep deprived. Ages 12 to 18, you're supposed to get nine hours of sleep. I was lucky to get half of that during my junior year. It was a real struggle for me to get through that year, especially with my grades the way they were. Now, in the middle of my junior year, I made a mistake by cheating on my girlfriend. And when this happened, I was one of the more popular students in my school, so it was like front page news to everyone else. I had to go to school and hear smart remarks and jokes behind my back. That to other people was lighthearted. It was funny, but to me, it was killing me on the inside. Now, one night, my depression got to a level three or four, really questioning my life what it would be like for other people if I just wasn't here. Would my friends be happier? Would my girlfriend be happier if I just wasn't here? I put pills on my desk. I called her and I told her, I have these pills on my desk. I don't know if I'm going to take them or not, but I just need help. And I have no way of saying that to my parents, no way of saying that to my therapist, but I just need help. Now, she knew that second step was to call my parents. So she calls my parents. My parents call the police. My door was locked, so the police had to bust into my room. They checked to make sure I didn't take any of the pills, which I didn't. And even though I didn't take any pills, they look at my parents and say, you have to take your son to a mental hospital. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I thought of a mental hospital, I'm thinking of padded walls, guys in straight jackets, jumping around, saying weird things like, flavor, Flav! Like, I didn't know what to expect going into that mental hospital. <coughs> now, I get there. And there's no padded walls. There are no guys in straight jackets. Um, there are no guys screaming flavor flav. But instead, it's guys who look just like me, but going through way worse problems. Guys who are 14, 15, already have babies, addicted to any drug you can name, already alcoholics, belong to gangs, have seen family members die right in front of them because of gang war. Here I am because I have depression and I cheated on my girlfriend. I felt like there was no reason for me to be in the same room, let alone the same building, as all these different kids. But I didn't understand until our first therapy session. 
Now, we all got in a circle and we said why we were there. And everyone else has these sad, traumatic stories. I'm scared to even stand up and say why I'm there. I'm embarrassed. Now, I'm the last to go by choice. I stand up and say, hi, my name is Jordan. Um, I'm here because I have depression. I'm upset about cheating on my girlfriend. I feel bad about it. And honestly, some days, I wake up just not wanting to be here. I'm sorry that my stories don't match up to any of yours. And the therapist stopped me. He explained to me that it's not the situation, it's not the event, but it's how you perceive it and it's how you handle it. And that's why we're all there. Because even though their situation seemed way worse than mine, we were handling what we were going through in a negative way. That's why we were there. Now, that was definitely one of the most important lessons that I learned being in that hospital and still something I carry with me. After being in there for a week, um, I finally felt comfortable coming back to the real world. I'll never forget the patients that I met, the therapists that I got to talk to, the things I was able to do in that mental hospital. But I get back to the real world, and it's a horrible transition all over again. There are two main reasons for this. The first was that I'm safeguarded from anything that could harm me emotionally in the mental hospital. There are no cell phones. There's only PG movies. It's kind of weird watching The Lion King and Aladdin that many times with all guys, but Good movies. <laughs> um, the, thir the other thing was that you didn't have computer. There were no computers, so there's no websites like, back then MySpace was cool, um, but there's no websites like Facebook. And a lot of times people will ask me how come websites like Facebook affect you know, people emotionally. I'll give you the perfect example. Uh, one of my best friends in high school, his name was Kevin. And uh, Kevin was dating this girl for over a year. Um, real great couple, wonderful. But one day they broke up. And so when I talked to Kevin, I wanted to make sure he was okay. I was like, hey, is everything all right? How, you know, I'm sure it's tough. He acted like it wasn't a big deal at all. He said, Jordan, don't worry about me. I didn't like her that much anyways. I'm already talking to other girls. Please don't worry. It's like, all right, cool. Now two weeks go by, and Kevin calls me on the phone. And it sounds like he's been crying. So I asked him what was wrong. And he sounds just like this. <sighs> She's with another dude. So I'm sorry to hear that, man. What happened? Did you see him on public? Did someone call you? No, nah, man. It's FBO. Now, I didn't know what FBO was at this point, so I played along like I did. I was like, dang, man, FBO, what? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> I was like, could you uh, remind me again what uh, FBO is? He's like, dude, it's Facebook official. Now, I didn't want him to know I was laughing, so I muted the phone. <laughs> and uh, I click over three seconds later. I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I'm sure she's just trying to make you jealous. They're probably just friends. Please don't worry about it. He said, no. I looked at the photo album. They have one together. They're in the profile picture together. It's FBO. I was like, all right. <laughs> I was like, well, there's one or two things uh, that we can do here. One, you can delete her as a friend. You can block her. You won't have to see those things ever again if you don't want to. Or two, stop stalking her. <laughs> and the point of that story is to say that there are things in life we know we want to avoid, people we don't want to see together, things we don't want to see that people say about us. But now we can see that with the click of the mouse. That's something that I was safeguarded from being in the hospital. Now, this is a part of the presentation where I love to ask this question because I think it's kind of funny. All right, how many people in here, raise your hand, would be completely screwed if Facebook started doing notifications to people, not that you liked someone's photo, not that you commented on someone's photo, but just the simple fact that you looked at their photo, how many people would be completely screwed? <laughs> I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. <laughs> All right. Kevin's obviously not the only one. All right. <laughs> so, now the second reason that it was a tough transition going back to my junior year was that no one still, they just didn't understand me. My depression, that I was in a mental hospital, I couldn't tell that to anyone. There were things that I told complete strangers in that mental hospital, people I just met, that I couldn't tell my best friends that I had known for years. So that was tough for me, coming back to the real world, knowing that no one truly cares where I've been. My parents just told everyone I was in a hospital, but no one went further than that to see where I was. So I fell right back into my midst of depression, saying, why well, talk about how I feel when no one really cares? My junior year, my junior summer, that was the first two times I got caught drinking by my parents. That was one of the worst feelings in the world because no one in my immediate family drinks. So whenever I got caught, I felt like the black sheep of the family. I felt like the failure of the family, the person that would never be successful. And I would yell that and I would scream that to my parents and they would have no idea where this is coming from because again, these are thoughts, these are emotions that I'm keeping to myself. I'm not expressing them. 
Now, right before my senior year, my parents went off to Pittsburgh, which is five hours away from where I live. And I decided, being in high school, making a dumb decision, I decided to throw a party. Now, the party gets busted by the police. And I'll never forget having to call my dad. I'm so upset. I'm crying. I'm telling my dad, you know, I'm so sorry for letting you down yet again as your son. Sorry for letting you down for the person that I am, making all these horrible decisions. But this time, it felt 10 times worse. My dad's the athletic director at my high school. I put his job in jeopardy because there are athletes there, including myself. The athletes there and myself, we were suspended for half of our season going into the year. I let down my dad, I let down my mom, I let down my sister, and I just beat myself over it every single day. By the time senior year started, I was constantly thinking about suicide, having suicidal thoughts, wondering what life would be like for other people if I just wasn't here. What I would do was go to school with my iPod at the loudest volume, and I played my shitty day playlist. It was the most depressing songs that I could find, that I could think of, and I'd walk around school at the loudest volume. So I'd, even if someone yelled or screamed my name, I didn't have to hear it. I just wanted to be numb to the world. Now, there were a couple great things that happened in the beginning of my senior year. I was nominated to homecoming court. That's awesome. It's great to be accepted by your peers, by your friends, but at the same time, it's just numb to me at this point. I was nominated for the individual playoffs for golf, which is great. It's a, something I should have been really happy about. I worked my entire high school career for that, but again, it's just numb to me at this point. Now, for the playoffs, I had to play a practice round. That's something I was excited about, because to this day, if there's anything that can take away my depression, bad thoughts, emotions, for four or five hours, it's playing golf. Now, my dad was excited. He picked me up that day. We were talking the whole way up there about how well I might do. And I get up there. I play a great round. I'm so excited to get back in the car and tell my dad all about it. But I get back in the car, and my dad looks really sad. So I asked him, Dad, what's wrong? Everything OK? He says, yeah, I'm just, I'm just really tired. I could understand that. It's around 5, 5.30. He works at a high school. I could understand why he might be a little exhausted near the end of the day. Now, we get home, and my car is still at school because my dad picked me up. So I reminded him, Dad, I got to go pick up my car from school. Now, he said to me, just go upstairs. Your mom's waiting for you. At this point, I start to panic because my parents and I didn't have that type of relationship where they would just be waiting for me upstairs to talk about my day. I barely talked to them. I was always on the run. So I thought this was kind of weird. I get upstairs, and my mom's on the sofa. She looks like she's about to cry. I asked her mom, what's wrong? She says, nothing. I'm just really tired. Now, my heart starts pounding questioning, what did I do this time to upset my parents, to disappoint them yet again? And that's when my dad walked in with a duffel bag full of alcohol, and he dropped it on the ground. Now, when he dropped that duffel bag, my heart dropped with it, saying, here I am, their son, and all I do is disappoint them, make them angry, frustrated, upset. All I do is disappoint them. They don't even want me to be their son anymore. I can tell by the look on their face, why am I here? There's no point in being on this earth anymore when I can never make the people that mean the most to me, my sister, my parents, if I can't make them happy, there's no point in being here. That was the night that I tried to take my own life by going out of my nine-story bedroom window. When I hit the ground 100 feet below, I broke my left fibula, which ripped through the skin. I broke my left tibia. I shattered my left femur. I broke my pelvis. I broke my jaw in four different places. And I broke my left wrist. I was bleeding internally from my brain and from my organs. When I was going to the hospital that night, I was in a coma for five days. Now, I wake up from this coma. A couple days go by. Everything is kind of weird to me. Everything feels like a dream. I don't even know what reality is. Now, I remember my first conscious thought was, I'm in a hospital. I have no idea why I'm here, but I'm in a hospital. And so I look around, and I want to feel what's going on. First thing I see, actually, first thing I felt was a trach in my throat. I can't talk. I have no voice. I look down on my arm, and there's an IV in my arm. I'm hooked up to three different monitors. I look at my left leg, and there are still rods coming out of my left leg. And my left hand is wrapped up like I'm about to go into a boxing match. I have no idea why I'm there. To this day, I don't remember going out my window. I remember everything that led up to it. I remember golfing that day. I can tell you about every hole. I remember the drive home. I remember looking at my mom, my dad's face. I remember heading to my room. But for some reason, my mind is blocked off. My brain is blocked off from actually going out of the window. So I had to lay there for weeks with all these people coming and visiting, my family, my friends. All these people are making posters telling me I can get through this. But no one wants to tell me what I'm coming from, what I'm trying to pull through from. Now, one night my sister was visiting. 
And to this day, my sister and I remain best friends. So I knew if there was one person that would tell me what happened and be honest, it was my sister. So I had to mouth to her because I still don't have a voice. I mouth to her what happened. She starts crying. Now I knew that anything she was going to say obviously isn't good if she's crying already. But she gathers herself. She looks back at me and she says, you went out your window. There were so many thoughts and questions of, well, who pushed me out my window? How drunk was I to actually accidentally go out my window? Who slipped me a drug for me to accidentally go out my window? She looks at me and she says, you were completely sober and no one was in the room. The words suicide attempt didn't even come into my head at this point. Yeah, I knew I had thoughts of not wanting to be here, but I never thought I would actually go through with them. Now, 19% of young adults contemplate suicide in a given year, but the ones who have depression are five times more likely to go through with it. I never thought I'd be a part of that statistic. So I had to lay there with no one else to blame but myself for going through with this suicide attempt. Now, within two months of this accident, the suicide attempt, a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer walks into my room. He found out about the story from a friend of his, and her daughter actually um, went to my high school. She graduated a year before me. And so he found out about my story. He contacted my dad. He emailed him, and he said, is there any possibility I can talk to your son about what he's going through about the suicide attempt? My dad said, you know, I'll think about it. He talked to my therapist. Therapist didn't want me to do it. It's too soon. This is literally within two months of the suicide attempt. My mom didn't want me to do it. This is too soon for me. I can't talk about this. My dad probably knows me um, better than anyone I know, but he said to me, I'm going to leave it up to you. If you want to do this interview, that's fine, but I think he just wants to talk to you. Now, the reason that I said yes to this interview is because I still don't have a voice at this point. I'm down to 80 pounds. I have no idea if I'll get out of a hospital bed, let alone get into a wheelchair, and the thought of walking isn't even in my mind at this point. I said yes because I'm in a hospital room with no voice, and no one can hear how I'm feeling. No one can hear the pain in my voice from what I've been through and what I'm going through right now. But I figured by spelling out, literally the entire first interview was spelled out on a spell chart. I figured that if I can spell out these words, there's people on the outside of this hospital who can touch the words that I want to say so that they're never in the position that I'm in right now in this hospital room, in this bed. Now the story came out in January of 2008. I didn't know until the day of that it would be the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Now being the front page, being the main story, it gained a lot of attention. Um, there were people who called, who visited, um, people that wrote in letters, um, emails from people thanking me for not only telling my story, but the one thing I heard over and over again was, thank you for making me feel as though I'm not alone with what I struggle with, with what I go through. And all this time, it's great to be making a difference, to be able to touch people with the story, help people through their life and what they're going through in mental health. But at the same time, I'm missing my entire senior year of high school, something I look forward to from day one. I remember the first time I walked into high school, and I said, I can't wait till I'm the big man on campus, running everything on this campus, everything in this school, the captain of all the sports teams, doing whatever I want to, but I'm missing out on that. I'm dependent on a wheelchair right now. I'm down to 100 pounds, but again, I'm missing my entire senior year of high school. Now, I was able to do two things that I always wanted to my senior year, go to senior prom, which was great. It's great to go to senior prom, enjoy that with your friends, but I'm going and I'm leaving prom in a wheelchair. I was able to graduate on time, which honestly I didn't think would be possible when I was in the hospital, but I was able to graduate on time with the rest of my class. I was able to walk with the walker to receive my diploma, but I'm going and I'm leaving graduation in a wheelchair. That's still tough for me to look back on, knowing I missed an entire year of my life that I can't get back, my senior year of high school. But what I said was that, why don't I focus on my future, what I can do today, tomorrow, next week, and improve my life with going through life. And it's not like I wanted to forget the suicide attempt, because I'm talking about it all the time, but I want to move forward. I want to make sure that it doesn't hinder me from going on with my life. That's what I was able to do. In 2008, that September, at August, excuse me, I enrolled into community college, which was great. I was glad to be there um, because I didn't have to pay as much as my friends who go into, you know, four-year universities. So I was happy to be there, but being at college, um, being on crutches at that point, caused some of the most awkward conversations I've ever had. The problem is that a lot of people have been on crutches, so the natural instinct is when they see someone on crutches, they want to compare stories. So I would be going to class, and this guy would see me, and he'd be like, 
hey man, I was on crutches for like four weeks, it sucked, you know, I broke my ankle, it was horrible, man. Um, but any, anyways, what'd you do? I'm like, shit. <laughs> um, yeah, um, actually, I fell nine stories. Automatically, they assume it's construction. I have no idea why. I'm like, yeah, I fell nine stories. Oh, man, construction? No. Um, I actually, I attempted suicide. I went out of my bedroom window. It was a suicide attempt. Oh, awkward. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what response, you know, people would have when I told them that. I always just assumed people heard that and would be like, sucks to be you, going to class. You know, I didn't know what people would say, um, but it actually started conversations that I never thought I would have with complete strangers. People that had connections to any depression, um, suicide attempts, uh, suicide in their family, whatever it may be. Um, so I was happy to be at college and felt comfortable with talking to people about what I do, because at that point, that's when I became a public speaker. Now, when I got to college, I noticed two main things um, that affect college students emotionally and mentally. The first is sleep. I was like, who gets sleep in college? It seemed like an impossible task. And I started noticing my friends and I would have these really unhealthy conversations of who slept the least, which was like a competition. And so I'd say, yeah, man, I um, only slept like four hours last night. It sucked. I got some coffee, though, so I should be good to go. We'll see. We'll see how the day comes out. My friend would be like, four hours. That's a lot. I actually only slept for an hour and a half last night. Um, woke up, had a Red Bull, no big deal. Um, and then I went to class, got some coffee, uh, five-hour energy shot, now I'm going to this party tonight. What up? I'm like, that's not healthy. You know, for people you know, in college to not sleep, because you know how you are when you don't sleep. Irritable, um, you can't pay attention as much. Um, your brain just can't absorb the information that you're trying to read, that you're trying to listen to. Now, there's actually 60% of college students are sleep deprived. 30% of college student, students admit to falling asleep at least once a week in class. I don't know about you guys, but I did it more. So <laughs> um, that's something that really affects mental health, that affects you emotionally and mentally and what you go through. Second major thing I noticed was alcohol and substance abuse. Huge thing. Now, seven out of 10 college students who abuse any substance, whether it's a drug, whether it's alcohol, one to two, actually seven out of 10 college students do that. One to two is because of depressed or depression, those thoughts. Three to four is because of anxiety. I noticed that a lot of my friends would drink when they were depressed. Um, the first thing out of their mouth when I went through a breakup would be, all right, let's go get a drink and forget about it. Um, I noticed, you know, again, that's unhealthy to think that's the first thing that they go through is actually going to drinking before anything else, before even talking. Second thing, anxiety. Anxiety is something that a lot of people don't, again, know extremely, exactly what it is. But anxiety is just the butterflies you feel before that first date. I'm um, at a sporting event, cheering for your team, hoping that you don't lose anything. That's anxiety. Now, there are other things that are extreme, like anxiety disorders, but that's exactly what it is, is nervousness. Now, one example of this is actually my friends did this in high school, and they still do it in college. We were supposed to go to a dance together, and I was driving, and my friends, I go to their house, and they're drinking. And um, I look at my friends and I was like, I didn't know what you're pre-gaming. What are you guys doing? Why are you pre-gaming them now? The dance isn't even for like four hours. They look at me and they're so embarrassed. They're like, look, uh, we didn't want to admit this, but we can't dance when we're sober. <laughs> I was like, what? They're like, we, we just can't dance when we're sober. We suck. I was like, all right, that's cool, but why wasn't I invited to this you know, party of pre-gaming before you dance? They look at me, and again, they're very embarrassed. They said, honestly, Jordan, you're black. We just assumed you could dance. <laughs> Which is very racist, but you know, they're my friends. <laughs> so for some reason, my friends had anxiety about dancing. So when they were sober, they thought they danced like McLovin. But when they were drinking, they thought like they danced like uh, Justin Timberlake. Is that a good example? Maybe Justin Bieber. Can he dance? Justin Bieber can dance, right? Anyways, so um, that is just an example of anxiety. What I notice in college also is that when I go around and speak at schools, so many of those college students don't know where to turn to when they go through those mental health issues, when they think they have a mental health disorder, when they're trying to help a friend. They don't know exactly where to go, where on campus they can go and talk to, the counselors that they can talk to, what hot hotline to call whenever, whenever they're going through a tough time. So that's really what I encourage you guys to do, is think about what I talked about today, and think about finding resources if you're going through a rough time, or if someone close to you is going through a rough time. It's actually, um, next month will be the uh, four-year anniversary of my suicide attempt. 
And the obvious question is, how am I doing today? I feel great today. I love what I do. I love being able to go around and speak at schools. I love going around the country. I get to travel. Um, you know, last night, actually, I want to read a text. Um, last night, um, the E60 clip that um, was nominated for an Emmy, they showed it for the third time last night. And um, I got this text, and I just want to pull this up because it reminds me of why I do what I do. I got this text because um, for some reason my phone number is on Facebook, which is kind of dangerous. But anyways, this, guy, this kid texted me. He said, my name is Eric Burton. You don't know me, but I added your personal page and public uh, page on my Facebook after your first E60 piece. I saw where you had posted your number on Friends, and I wrote it down. I just wanted to personally tell you how much you have helped me through depression issues, through E60 and everything you say on Facebook. If it wasn't for you, I would have never gotten help, and I honestly wouldn't be here. I mean, that's why I do what I do. I love being able to make a difference, to be able to touch people, to start conversations. That's what I hope you guys can do, is continue dialogue. Now, even though I love my job, I also have to have a healthy emotional balance that doesn't include negative coping mechanisms like drinking to express emotions. My healthy emotional balance includes listening to music, um, being able to hang out with friends, going to see movies, watching my favorite TV shows. But it's finally that time of the year. I'm so happy during this time of the year because I can do the ultimately favorite thing to do. What I do is I drive around with my windows down, right? And I play loud rap music. And I don't mean like Will Smith rap music, I mean like curse every two seconds a Lil Wayne rap music, right? So I drive around, my stereo is very loud, I drive around, just cruising, and I go to a stoplight purposely next to an old person, and their windows are down. And they're so offended by their music that they actually roll their windows up because of me. I love that. It makes me so happy. <laughs> so. Maybe for you it's something extremely odd, weird to other people. Maybe you have you know, something that you love to do, something you love to watch. Your guilty pleasure might be watching Jersey Shore on Thursdays. You know, what, I, you know, I know what time because it's my guilty pleasure too. Um, so maybe that's what it is. You have to find that healthy emotional balance. Even though I have that, even though I have all of that, great job, healthy emotional balance, at the end of the day I still have depression. It's not a cold that goes away after a couple weeks, after you take some medicine and go to see a therapist, but it's still something I deal and cope with much better than I did four years ago. Now at the end of today, I don't want everyone in here to just focus on just me, just my story, but on the entire mental health spectrum that I try to touch upon today. That includes everyday issues we all go through, stress, anxiety, sleep deprivation, that includes other disorders out there besides the ones that I mentioned. There's eating disorders, OCD, ADHD. Now there are traumatic events that can happen to you. Like I said, someone passing away, going through a horrible breakup, going through a really tough time in school, living up to certain standards. That can be traumatic events that you have to talk about. And like I said before, earlier, substance abuse, alcohol abuse. That's something that affects college students, that affect young adults. And that's still something that I hope you guys can continue in a conversation, not just today, not just tomorrow, but next week, next month, amongst yourself and anyone else that you know. In conclusion, uh, when I was doing the interview for this story, the original interview, I was hoping that it would make it acceptable and actually cool for young adults to talk about how they feel and feel confident in doing so. I'm hoping by the end of today, you all have the courage to take that first step. So thank you guys so much for letting me share my story today. You've been a great audience. Thank you. All right. So, okay, that took about an hour. All right, um, at this point, what I would love to have is um, you guys ask me any questions. Um, you can ask me about the story. You can ask me about mental health advice I can try and give you. Um, so please, feel free to ask me any question that you guys want. I know it always takes a couple seconds, so take your time. <laughs>